people are asking a question which I feel I certainly am sure many people have back in their minds and won't like your answer possibly, but let's see. Um, so some people say they can't drink coffee without a sweetener. Um, is it better to use sugar instead of a sweetener? Yeah. Some people say is stevia okay? Um, and let's let's ask for a positive way of looking at it at the end, where somebody says, could you share some recipes that you know make foods less bland um, this way? Because I think yes. I think I can't survive without my honey. For yes, yes, yes. Very good question. I'm going to start with that final question. And so, so lots of my patients come, particularly to the first session, they're really worried, uh, you know, what is this going to be like? Am I just going to be eating this really bland, like food? Or, you know, I'm, I don't know if I'm, if I'm up for this. And what I always say then to, to reassure them is that if you cook and eat the way of this program, and if you have friends over and you cook this food for your friends, they will never know you are on a plan of any kind. They will just simply say to you, wow, you eat really well. This is delicious food. And my patients always like, tend to carry a packed lunch to work because you know, what's out there isn't great quality. And they say, my colleagues are always just peering over to me. They're having their kind of mass produced sandwich. And they're staring at me just enviously because I've got my you know, amazing box of, of, of goodness. So there's tons and tons of suggestions in the book, both photographic, printed recipes, super speedy ideas as well. There's a food list and then you can just put it together however it takes your fancy. But never let your food be bland. Have plenty of variety because you've got to enjoy the way you eat. You know, eating is a, is a huge pleasure in life. You know, it shouldn't feel that, oh, you know, I'm just missing out. You know, that's if you feel that way, um, then, you know, you might need to go back to the book to check because it shouldn't it shouldn't feel that way at all. Then there's that question about sweeteners. What about sweetener in my coffee? You know, what about stevia? I can't I can't live without honey. And, and, and you know, loads of my patients feel that way, so please, please don't worry. What I would say about artificial sweetener is the clue is in the name, it's artificial. Um, and therefore, when we're thinking about kind of eating kind of real food, um, real food is not called kind of artificial eggs, artificial apples, you know, that's just food. So I think firstly, the name gives us pause for thought. Second issue is that when we're always having sweetness, even in a, in a drink that should be fairly bitter, like coffee, it never recalibrates our tastes. And so we just always want everything to taste very sweet and unnaturally sweet. And the food industry are really onto that. So even savory products now have either artificial sweetness or sugar in because that's what consumers want. What you find very quickly is when you drop that really quickly, if you ever go back to it, it really tastes bad because you think, oh my gosh, this not only tastes so sweet, it tastes like, like a chemical. Um, so I, I really would urge people, just, just try. Uh, you'll be really surprised at what you find, because I have, I have patients who might be drinking 10 cans of Diet Coke a day, who say, I can't, I can't function without Diet Coke. And they come to a session a couple of weeks later, and they're like, I gave up Diet Coke, and, and, and nobody can believe it, you know. I had it on, on, on kind of repeat order, um, but, but uh, I don't have it anymore. So just, you know, the thing is be open-minded. I always say in the book, and I say to my patients, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So that if you like to have coffee, but you want your eating windows to still be closed, go ahead. Who can function in the morning without tea or coffee? I can't, so I never give advice that I wouldn't kind of <laughs> put into practice myself. So if you have coffee with a splash of milk, is your eating window still closed? is fine you know so so don't make the perfect the enemy of the good but at the same time if you can steer your tastes away from all this sweetness you'll taste the natural sweetness things like carrots or cream or things like tomatoes and some people might be watching going carrots are sweet that's, that's just bonkers you know i want i want stevia but actually really quickly that beautiful natural sweetness kind of shines through if you if you let that recalibration happen you answered another question from someone mm. saying, can they have um, coffee with milk in their closed window? And I think Wait. the answer is yes. At the yes. End of the book. And when I saw this question, I thought, oh, that's a bit mean. I'm not going to ask it. Oh, but then I've changed my mind because yeah. it's not at all. It's the question I suppose you answer in the first page of your book. Mm. So I'm going to ask it, particularly because I can tell from talking to you that you won't find this mean. An anonymous attendee says, if your diet is supposed to be so good, yes. how come I've never heard of it before? <laughs> and it's not well known like Slimming World. So actually, you answer that before you talk about anything else. And it's, it's right. sort of, um, the thing that's most staggering, you know, this breakthrough science. Why don't yeah. we know about it? 
It's it's so true. And my patients always say, you know, because they've lost all this weight and then their friends and family, they go out and they say, how have you lost all this weight? They say, I, I'm, I'm doing this diet. And they all say, why have we never heard of it? They're Googling it. And they just can't find it. So the reason people haven't heard of it is this, that, that we, are, um, we are the Imperial Weight Centre. So we are the kind of NHS part, I suppose, or NHS partner of Imperial College London, which lots of people will have heard of as a very famous kind of science and medicine university. And so within the Imperial Weight Centre, we look after people with some of the most complex and important weight problems in this country. Um, so, so people coming to our service urgently need solutions. And several years ago, we became dispirited with the lifestyle advice and, and the outcomes that people were getting because they were trying. These were not people sort of just sort of, you know, telling us what we thought, what they thought they wanted, that we needed to hear and sort of going off and doing something else. They were really trying and, and the weight wasn't shifting, the health wasn't improving. And so we said, look, you know, we're an academic unit. We've got really, really strong connection to Imperial College London. There is all this phenomenal science out there why don't we tell our patients none of us had an answer to that yeah why don't, why don't we tell our patients about the science you know what, what what would happen if we did so that's why this program was made this is just you know designed around all this fantastic science and sharing it in an enjoyable way that people love and own and can use in a practical way so great question you know, why haven't i heard of it because it's so effective and it's been published but you know hey you know, probably not too many people are gonna, are gonna go into the scientific journals to read about it. It's because at the moment, you've got to come to our hospital to do it. You know, you've got to be referred to our hospital by your GP um, in order to take part in it. So it's a really, you know, relative to the whole country, it's a really small cohort of people who are currently benefiting. And that's why I wrote the book. Because my patients and my colleagues were always saying, you've got to write a book. Because no matter how many people can be referred to this clinic, and it's not a huge number because we're a highly specialist unit, so many more people out there can benefit from this program, from this knowledge, and can improve their health and lose weight. So that's why I wrote the book. So hopefully now more people will, will know about it and can, and can use all of the stuff that we've been using in-house for a long time. Good, I'm glad I did ask it. No, I'm really glad. That wasn't mean at all. That was a fabulous no. question. Uh, um, no, it wasn't mean. I just thought it was like, well, that, but it was right, absolutely the right question Ooh. to ask. Um, another one that uh, is important, but I'm sure people are wondering, how does the diet work on the cholesterol level, which mm. always seems that fat is a bad thing? I mean, we touched on that very much. The yes. Cholesterol yeah. is we didn't necessarily, we, I didn't mention. Yes. So, so that, uh, that is a question that people ask. They say, you know, I've been told that I have to have a very low fat diet because I, I have to watch my cholesterol. So I think it's important to say that the cholesterol that we eat, so the cholesterol in things like eggs, for example, is not the cholesterol that we're measuring in those blood tests. The cholesterol that we measure in blood tests is the cholesterol that is made inside you by your liver and doesn't really have a relationship with the cholesterol that you're eating. What we have found when we put the program through our research study is that people's profiles improve. So the fatty particles in their blood called triglycerides linked to things like metabolic syndrome, they fall, it's a good thing. The heart healthy cholesterol, the HDL rises. And that's even though all those low fat foods have been chucked out and people are eating in a natural way. So as I say, this is not a high fat diet. Lots of diets out there asking you to base your meals on fat. It's, it doesn't sound very appetizing to me and it's, it doesn't sound terribly healthy, but they're eating fat in a normal, regular way, a bit of butter on their veg or, you know, some, some olive oil in their cooking and so on. And their parameters improve. And I have looked after people so ill that they would like to get on the heart transplant list. So I don't have... Um, what's the word? Um, I don't have worries about people, even if they have health conditions uh, or cardiovascular conditions, you know, like my patients who even, you know, so well, they need a heart transplant following this plan. Um, uh, another Although that said, I'll, say, I'll put one caveat, Hannah, which I say in the book, is that all of my patients, I suppose I have to say this, have had a medical review before they get going. So I do yes. say in the book, I say, check with your doctor, have a chat to your doctor, Maybe you need some blood tests before you get going or you need to talk about your medications and so on. But um, um, I, I'm, I'm not worried that 
eating in this way will adversely affect the cholesterol profile. We showed that in our research study. So you write, you write about goals, um, in, and Stella says losing weight is the easy part. Yeah, many people in brackets relative to the long term task of keeping that loss and all of their improved biomarkers. What is the success rate for your patients in long term weight maintenance, two to five years, for example? Yeah, it's a really good question. So I follow them up to about a year. Our research study goes to a year, and people are either maintaining or still losing. Um, I would say the success rate carries on in a very good proportion, but I don't have, I haven't published that data. I completely agree that the long-term success is the holy grail. I'm a doctor. We are doctors and scientists in this unit, and we're not that interested in kind of short-term, you know, I lost some weight to go on holiday, I lost some weight to go to the wedding. It's kind of not our, I think it's great, and that's great if that makes you feel good, but that's not sort of what gets us out of bed in the morning. It's the long-term is so, so, so important. It kind of brings me back to why the program can't just be about change your food because you've got to address the behaviors and the mindset as well because if you have things like early questioners asked about like emotion driven eating very hard to sustain changes long term unless those things are addressed so however you choose to lose weight and regain your health whether it's this or something else i would say it has to be a multifaceted approach because you didn't gain weight for one reason like I didn't know what food to eat or I just wasn't exercising enough so you need to have that sort of multi-dimensional response and I think that makes sustainability more likely but I agree it's the long term the long term that is so 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 important and important to the NHS which I mentioned in my book because you know um, the NHS needs us to be healthy and, and, and fit and that's sort of one of the priorities certainly from our unit. Um, I feel like uh, as some people are saying that um, what is brought up in the other chapters of the book mm. we've touched on I think uh, what sleep um, we, we, people will have to read the book to see that the things we've missed are things like um, perhaps exercise um, mm. Perhaps I would ask you, because that's, I think, one of the only things I've you know, missed that's interesting is your, in the last minute, um, is uh, your point that it's not about, we've got to um, get rid of this idea of burn, burning off the calories. Yeah, the exercise. exactly right. So, so lots of us feel we have to exercise to burn it off, but it really doesn't work that way. So at the start of our chat, we spoke about you having fuel tanks, your liver, your muscles and your fat stores. And in your liver and in your muscles, you've got about a thousand stored calories. And you will use those fuel stores preferentially and first when you are exercising. So first off, to get through a thousand calories of stored fuel, you've got to exercise for a long time, like quite a few hours, you know, depending if you're just doing some pretty standard exercise. So the idea that, you know, I'm gonna have some biscuits, but I'm gonna run on the treadmill for half an hour later to burn it off, all we've done is used up the liver storage, the liver the starch stored in the liver. So just on that level, the burning it off doesn't work. We haven't got anywhere near the fat stores, which are the third fuel tank and the last one to be tapped into when we, when we exercise. And burning it off doesn't feel enjoyable. It feels like a duty or like, you know, oh, you know, I'm going to make this food choice, but then I need to offset it by exercising. It doesn't feel joyful. So one of the messages I really hope to convey in my book is exercise and I tried to give pointers on this, if you can make it such a positive and nothing to do with burning off, if you build it into your day, so you're always moving and you're, and you're sort of very rarely still, you don't accept stillness, not only with your physical health improve, but your mood will improve so much, your sleep will improve. So I, I say to my patients, if I could prescribe exercise, I would. It is the most potent, it's such a potent intervention. Unfortunately, um, oh, um, the time has flown by. Um, flown by. A huge number of questions. I think more than I can remember having for a long time. Um, so if I haven't answered them, I'm 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 sorry. Um, we might have to organise another event with you where we just go through people's questions because, of course, people have so many personal questions. Of course, but they will buy the book and they will find them in there. So I'll just end. With, um, KJ says, "Not a question, but could I please thank you very much?" Oh. I thought twice about joining. Um, they said, but um, as I often find 
sometimes conversations more shame triggering, triggering than helpful. But you've been amazing at only using positive motivational language. It's definitely made me inclined to read the book. Um, and it's true. It's a very upbeat um, upbeat uh, language that you use and language of course you talk about as well yes thank you very much indeed it's been my pleasure Hannah thank you thank you very much indeed